Thanks for joining us today. We've got a great episode. So today we're going to be talking about a new report that just came out. It's called Data at Risk. And this is a global analysis of over 500 organizations across the globe around their data security and how they've been struggling with uh, data protection during uh, remote work. But before we dive into the survey, I'd like to introduce my speakers. Brad, go ahead and introduce yourself for our, our viewers. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, Brad Moldenhauer, uh, I work on our uh, transformation team and primarily on the, uh, uh, the CISO organization. Been with Zscaler for about a year and a half, and as many of you know, Zscaler customer for six years before that. Looking forward to the dialogue. Brad, why don't you introduce yourself for everyone? Thanks, Steve. I'm Brett James, Director of Transformation Strategy here at Zscaler. I'm pretty new here, coming from a, an engineering company where I was there for 16 years. I worked there as a customer of the Zscaler platform for about three years. Awesome. Great to have you with us, Brett. So let's jump into this. As I mentioned, this is a new report. It's called Data at Risk. It's a survey of over 500 global organizations. We asked C-suite, we asked VP, and we asked IT how they're dealing with data security. So we're going to unpack these results. And Brad, I'm going to go to you for the first question. The, the question we asked these companies was, have you seen data breaches rise during remote work? And surprisingly, three out of four, 74% said they did. But what I really want to unpack a little bit is the next question was, do you feel what caused these data breaches? And you can see that uh, you know, a fair a majority, 63% said that remote work caused data breaches. But you can also see some organizations calling out IT complexity, calling out cloud apps, and even legacy network security approaches are all causing challenges with data breaches. So Brad, as a CISO, what do you think is, from your perspective, is causing a risk across these organizations? Well, I mean, taking a look at the options that were available, and like you mentioned, we got a pretty good distribution, right? So, I mean, I believe all of these uh, contributors can be ratcheted up to a failure to modernize, right? I mean, we've seen legacy network uh, security approaches lead to efficacy deterioration of security controls, right? Typically, if you break that down a little bit more, you know, attempting to, to retrofit um, a legacy security architecture to a global remote, remote workforce and application transformation, you know, apps move into SaaS, you know, it's, it's inevitably gonna lead to more complexity. And you know what comes with that? Duct tape, bubble gum, bailing wire. And, and I, I would, you know, also say that, you know, supporting an entire remote workforce, you know, wasn't something that I believe was fully tested in companies disaster recovery and business continuity planning scenarios widely. I, I do fundamentally believe that by some of the challenges we saw with this. So, you know, when I see survey results that are blaming remote work directly for the rise in security incidents, you know, cynically, I do have to wonder if this is actually a failure with security teams to properly manage and mitigate risk. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. It's funny, you, you, you've heard it mentioned a couple of times, sometimes inertia is your biggest enemy. You're so programmed on doing the same things over again, you really kind of are unable to break free and kind of transform to the cloud and some of these things. Brett, I'm gonna take this next question to you. We asked these organizations, right, what is the biggest security challenge with remote work? And this is actually a two-part answer. Half of the responses were really around the idea that users are bypassing corporate solutions. So they're either using personal devices or they're using personal apps or even they're turning off security altogether. From your perspective, what do you think companies can do to protect themselves better? Well, Steve, I think first, when you look at those numbers, it's, it's fairly obvious where the issues are. So most corporate app environments are ugly and slow, so users just ignore them when they can. It's night and day when you compare things like Facebook and Snapchat to the company ERP or their old school intranet sites. And you know the same goes for to the tools that the companies provide to their users, like VPN. That's a pain to get going. You get the security agents that will bog the systems down and make it even worse if they're on um, old hardware using spinning disks instead of you know SSDs. Users will always take the path of least resistance to get the work done. And if that path is a modern mobile app on their personal device, well, you know, so be it. You know, those that bypass the security there, I, I put those people in two buckets. You get those that just do it by mistake, just really to get the job done faster, like using their their favorite browser instead of what 
you know, the IT organization provides, or maybe communicating through their personal chat apps instead of using corporate email. And you get those ones that do it on purpose, like turning VPN off or disabling the security agents because it's all just too slow. But I don't think most of these people are doing it on purpose to hide anything from the company. It's just about getting the job done. But the problem for the company is that it causes blind spots and then they start losing control of the data. It's like when the kids are in the other room, you know, doing their schoolwork, asking for lunch, asking for some help, you know, those are just even more reasons to get the job done quickly. At the end of the day, I think users, they just want to be productive. They want to get their job done. And sometimes they'll, they take matters into their, their own, own hands. So, Brett, the other half of this question was really the idea that uh, organizations are responding that I think they feel like users are struggling on how to handle data. So 56% said that their users don't know how to identify sensitive data. And the 44% said, hey, they're oversharing in dangerous ways. Maybe they're sending this data to someone outside the organization or leaving open uh, links on this data. All right. From your perspective, you talked to a lot of customers. How can companies help users improve in this area? Well, tools are a big issue. I remember at a previous employer, they first rolled out mandatory email classif- classification. That went down like a lead balloon because it was unwieldy, it was slow, and it didn't even work on mobile devices. So users just ignored it completely or left it at the default lowest classification, de- defeating the purpose of the whole thing. I think that describes any situation where you're uh, relying on the users to manually do something that they don't understand about or they just don't care. Again, they just want to get the job done. When this, when this says um, 56% of users can't identify it, I'd wager a good chunk of those just struggled with the tools they were using. Now, there are a couple of things here to fix it. First, you need to fix those tools. You need seamless tools for the user to help them classify the data. And then you need some automation on the infrastructure side to help them out. There are some pretty powerful DLP tools out there that automatically classify the data based on string matches or on pattern recognition or even policy based on where the uh, the data sits, but it, it's not gonna be 100%. Now, I'm really waiting for the day machine learning starts to understand the context of the data so it can be classified correctly. And then some we'll get somewhere close to 100%. But then on the other hand, we'll probably have to start worrying about Skynet and the machines taking over the world at that point. So maybe not such a good idea. <laughs> One of my favorite movies, by the way, love, uh, love, love to Terminator. Uh, Brad, I'm going to take the next one back to you. So we ask organizations, right, um, what's the most dangerous risk facing your data? Now, the results here are kind of evenly split. You can see BYOD is up there adopting dangerous uh, work trends. Data is getting more distributed outside the perimeter and inconsistent controls as users travel on off network. You're a CISO. I'm going to let you break this tie. From your perspective, what's the biggest risk that organizations are, are, are facing? So if I had to select one of those, the inconsistency of controls across user access scenarios would get my vote as that impacts all the other uh, options there, right? So what, I mean, think about it. Inconsistency of controls across user access scenarios. Essentially, what that says is risk is identified, managed, and mitigated in certain scenarios and then unseen unmanaged and unmitigated in the other so in one area it's acceptable and in other areas it's unacceptable i mean for example a device is off network and engaged in unprotected browsing it rejoins the network locally or remotely because it's authorized to do so and now you have lateral movement risk if that device acquired malicious code during the lack of consistent security coverage right So, you know, in the adoption of dangerous work trends is interesting to me uh, because it goes directly against the notion of culture being the strongest form of control in an organization. You know, I always emphasized and demonstrated in my previous role that security and privacy were everyone's responsibility. So as an example of that, you know, we had identified through our detection-based controls that some of our legal team was forwarding business or client-related work product to their personal email because they didn't feel like working on it over VPN or VDI. I went to these individuals and said, look, I know what you're doing. And I asked them, what happens 
If a litigation hold is administered on the client matter or that scope of work, your personal Gmail account just became discoverable. But you know, the fear of a personal mailbox being subjected to discovery, yeah, that, that's how you change behavior, right? Now, one last question I'd like to kind of uh, propose to both of you, and it was really the question we asked these organizations, okay, how do you feel like you wanna move forward and fix some of these challenges? Uh, we got you know a resounding response that you know there, there's two sort of the trends that these organizations are looking at. One is the idea of uh, adopting a consolidated platform, and the other one is uh, you know what the majority is saying, hey, we're looking at zero trust approach to solve some of these issues. So, Brad, I'm going to start with you. What's the biggest benefit from a unified platform from your perspective? So, what I would say is centralized visibility at scale is probably the most important because my job is to manage and mitigate risk. And if I have centralized visibility and at scale, that means now I have carte blanche to enforce preventive, detective, or response-based controls and tune them to what our business velocity requirements are. I, I'm advising customers all the time with some of these things where it's like, well, why would you know your users ever need to upload like these like an archive type file to you know uncategorized websites i get that you can't block them just enough legitimate traffic but i mean these are the kind of things i think about because if you get malicious code on there and it's a stage one uh you know like uh extortionware uh type attack well hey i mean if that's an allowed channel to just zip up a bunch of data and just send it out to some uncategorized site I mean, yeah, that's something that you could, you don't even need content driven uh, protection to do that. Um, so I think that, you know, that the centralized visibility and its scale really opens up, you know, what it is that you can do and it allows you to see risk and then treat it appropriately. Brett, I want you to chime in on this from another perspective. We're starting to hear more and more about security service edge. It's sort of a component of SASE and it really talks about bringing together uh, secure Web Gateway, CASB, and ZTA into a unified platform. So as you start to kind of see some of these technologies come together, do you think that changes what we need from a platform? Yeah, S Security Service Edge, uh, or SSE, I'm seeing it written. That's like another acronym for us to remember. I, I yeah. like SASE because you can say it, S-A-S-E, SASE. But how do you say SSE? Is like, S -S -S I don't know. <laughs> S-E, S -S -E. Anyway, uh, well... Like I think gone are the days, I think, of enterprises knitting together best of breed point solutions to achieve their security goals. They're expensive, inefficient to manage, and then you get gremlins starting to appear as the traffic goes from you know, device to, to device and user performance suffers. I think as the zero trust landscape has evolved to back in the day, we had multiple boxes in the data center to what SSE platforms are offering today. It's really attractive for enterprises and why we're seeing such a massive take up. They offer all those essential services like SWGs, CASBs, and that ZTNA access that makes your networks invisible from the outside. You wrap all those up together into a single mature platform and then you've got no need to go through the headaches of trying to integrate all those different point solutions. And then if you do it in the cloud, it means the management overhead is reduced and, you and your user's performance doesn't suffer either. It makes it so easy for organizations to grow and start to adopt these things once they have the agility to embrace that in the cloud. So before we go, I just kind of want to have you guys chime in. Any last thoughts on the, on the survey of the report? Uh, I've been saying for a while, we need an agile security architecture that quickly and automatically learns and adapts to new challenges as they emerge. A learning system is harder harder to uh, defeat because it can more quickly and predict, thus prevent new attacks, right? And the pace of change is so rapid that we can't predict all the challenges we're going to face. And manual or semi-manual processes have proven to be inadequate. Yeah, in my former life, I was focused on the user presentation of the apps and their, and their services, whether it's cloud or on-prem. And if anything is true, it's that the users will find an easier way to do their job. It, it's as simple as that. It could be a different app, a different device, or just that they don't do what they're supposed to do if it's quick or easier. And I think this is what the data in that survey shows. Um, organizations, I think, can't keep building on top of their 30-year-old network security model 
and expect to just magically make it easy for people to do their jobs. So for many, a wholesale transformation is going to be the only way to deal with the cloud and its inherent threats. Makes perfect sense, Brett. So that's going to do it for us. Uh, again, if you would like to get more information, you can go to zscaler.com slash data risk, where you can download the report and you can read all the survey results for yourself. And we want to thank both Brad and Brett for joining us, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks a lot.